Today we're in Matthew 23. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12 as we continue our verse-by-verse study here in the, in the book of Matthew. And what I'm planning on doing is taking the first 12 verses. And we're going to be looking at certain characteristics of the false teacher, but we're also going to be concluding by looking at characteristics of a genuine teacher. It's going to take a while to develop the foundation for you, but we'll get into it and then we'll look at practical application as we go through this. So let's begin reading. In Matthew 23 at verse 1, I'll read to verse 12, and we'll get into our our study. Matthew 23, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you, do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so we're going to be looking today at the distinguishing traits, characteristics found in Matthew 23 of a genuine as well as a false teacher. And so looking at the traits of a false teacher, genuine teacher, people today, especially today, would probably be asking the question, what does that really matter? Does that really matter? I mean, listen, if you believe in God, isn't that enough? Is there such a thing as a false teacher? Is there such a thing as a genuine teacher? Don't they all teach truth? Don't all teachers hold to basically the same kinds of things and all? So what does it matter what we believe as long as we're sincere in our attempt to do that, which is is, uh, what we most hold dear to ourselves? What's the big deal? What's the difference? Does it really matter? Well, it does matter because eternity hinges on what you believe. You see, the Bible teaches very clearly that there is such a thing as truth. The Bible teaches that there is truth and truth is scripture. Psalm 119, 160 says it like this, the entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. The entirety of your word is truth. The word of God is truth. That's why Jesus in John 17, 17 in his prayer said to his father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So it's a ministry of a pastor teacher to teach truth. We have been called by God, equipped by God to teach truth to the congregation. And truth is intended to transform our way of thinking, which obviously affects our way of living. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says there, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Truth matters. And what we believe is what we do. And that's why we get into the Word. That's why we take time to study the Bible. That's why we want to equip you Because the Word of God teaches that pastor teachers are intended by God to equip the saints. How do I know that? Well, the Bible itself says that in Ephesians chapter 4, in verses 11 through 15, this is what Paul wrote. Speaking of God, he is the one who gave these gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full-grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. Then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. Instead, we will hold to the truth in love, becoming more and more in every way like Christ, 
who is the head of his body, the church. God gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry so that we can come to full maturity so that when false teachers will creep into the, into the church, when false teachers begin to knock on doors to influence you to believe certain things, you will have been taught properly so you're able to give a defense concerning the hope that lies within you and not be deceived and ensnared and taken and entrapped by those who would use you for their own profit. You see, the genuine minister is to faithfully divide the Word of God and to present the Word of God in a faithful way. And Jesus reveals that as the trait of a genuine teacher. He had said to the apostle Peter when Peter was being restored by Jesus there in John chapter 21, he had said to him, uh, Peter, do you love me? And uh, when they were having that conversation, it's a very famous conversation there, Jesus said this to him. He said, if you love me, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. So what, are we, what, what was Peter to be feeding to, to uh, the congregation? The word of God. He was to faithfully divide God's word. That's how you're spiritually fed. And so God has called pastors and teachers not into the entertainment industry, but in the proclamation industry to teach the word of God, to equip the saints. So we don't, we don't come to church to be entertained, at least I don't, and I'm pretty sure you're not. And so when we gather, we gather to be equipped for works of service so that when you leave these four walls and somebody approaches you and begins to speak to you and give to you things that they say come from God, so that you'll be equipped to know what is right and what is wrong because there are many false teachers who've gone out who are attempting to undermine the flow of the Spirit and the work of God through His Word. No doubt about that. We'll look at that in some detail as we continue our study. And so that's exactly what we want to do today is to talk about that. You see, Matthew 23, this chapter that we're looking at, contains Jesus' last public message. And it's interesting as we go through this, it's very interesting to note what he thought was important to give to the public. This message isn't about salvation. This message isn't about the resurrection. This message isn't even about principles for kingdom living. What this is, is a warning. It's a sober warning concerning false teachers. Now notice in verse one how it says, here in Matthew 23, verse 1, Jesus is speaking to multitudes as well as his disciples. So that helps us to know that he's concerned for both those who are saved as well as those who are unsaved. You see, false teachers will turn people away from God. They teach things that are not true, and they contradict that which is. Today, just to give you a common example, and it's a very easy example to use because we're all familiar with this, today, now, there are many who are arguing that there is not just one way to the Lord, but there are many ways, and actually we all worship the same God. You'll see that sometimes on, on the bumper sticker philosophies that, that are all through our, our city and, and our state into our nation, where you'll have like little bumper stickers that will say things like coexist, and they have major religious symbols and all, where to coexist, you know, just take the essentials that we all agree with, live by those, and don't make a big deal about the things that, that, that actually divide us and all of that. So part of the argument that's going on today, part of what is being deter, uh, declared today, and many of you have heard this and perhaps some of you believe this, is that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. We've all heard that, haven't we? You'll hear it on the news. You hear it in, you read it in newspapers, should you read the newspaper. It's, it's out there on, on uh, blog sites and it's, it's on Facebook and Instagram and all the various social media that we have. There will be somebody there who will say, listen, Christians and Muslims worship the same God. Just as an example, just as an example as I'm laying an introduction here. The question is, is that true? Is that true? Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? I just read it yesterday. Somebody was posting, theologian, either that or... He drives a truck, I'm not sure, but, but they, were, they were posting that we all worship the same God. Is that true? I'm not asking for you to answer. I'm asking you to think about it. Do you, and let me be personal with you for a moment, do you believe that Allah and God, the Father, is the same God? Do you believe that? I'm not asking you to answer once again. 
but have you been influenced to believe that? If you do, you're wrong. And I'll tell you why. It's because I like to bully you. No, it's because when you read the Quran, this is one of the scriptures, quote unquote, that they use in the Quran, and it's found in 112, one through four in the Quran. Say, he is God, the one and only God, the eternal absolute. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. He begets not, nor is he begotten. What is the essential of the Christian faith if it is not the incarnation of God in human flesh? What is it that we celebrate as Christians every Christmas season? The birth of God the Son. You cannot believe that Jesus Christ is not God if you're reading your Bible. You can't believe that because the Bible declares that he is God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was made flesh, dwelt amongst us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh. God the Father has a son. His name is Jesus. The Bible teaches that. If you are reading your Bible, you could not believe what Muslims teach concerning Jesus as simply a prophet, the son of Miriam. You could not believe that because you're reading the Bible. God the Father has a son named Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. Anybody who denies that doesn't know God. And so as Christians, we do not worship the same quote unquote God that Muslims do because God is declared in scripture as having a son and his name is Jesus Christ. You see, genuine teaching is eternally important. It needs to be understood as such because your eternity rests on what you believe concerning Jesus Christ. In Galatians in chapter one, verses eight and nine, Paul said it like this. The apostle Paul said, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. You see, Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that Jesus Christ is the first creation of God. If you've ever spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm gonna assume that all of us have because they knock on our doors to our neighborhood, they're very faithful to do that, right? I'm gonna assume you've spoken to them. And if you say to them that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in human flesh, he is God the Son, they will argue with you. And as they argue with you, they'll tell you that he's Michael the Archangel. How do I know that? I've had many discussions over the years with Jehovah's Witnesses, that's exactly what they'll tell you. He is Michael the Archangel. But when you ask him, and I've done this, can you show me a scripture that says that? Where does the Bible say that? They will say, well, Michael means who is like God. And I'll say, that's true, speaking of an angel. But then again, where does it say that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel? I have said this, I'm quoting myself in conversation. I've said, can you show me a scripture that says Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel? Well, our theology, I'm not asking you about your theology, I understand you have one, but can you show me scriptures? You see, you can't believe that if you read the Bible. That comes from outside sources, that comes from traditions, that comes from their interpretation, but it doesn't come from scripture. So there are true teachers and there are false teachers and truth matters because Paul said, if we or an angel of God should give you a different message, a different gospel than the one you received, well, that's cool, no problem, at least he's speaking about God. No, he said, let them be accursed. Let them be accursed. Mormons say that Moroni brought a, a message to Joseph Smith. We are an angel from God. Muslims say that Gabriel gave that message of the Quran to Muhammad. 
we are an angel of God. It fits perfectly. The prophecies were already given. We've been equipped to know these things. And yet we have Christians who run around arguing with other Christians that we shouldn't judge these people. Who's judging them? We are discerning truth from error. And we are saying, thus saith the Lord, because the word of God is clear concerning this but because the church is very ignorant concerning even basic doctrines because the church doesn't read the Bible. They're easily swept away by every wind of doctrine and slight cunning of men. That's exactly what Paul was speaking about. And we're living in a time when people will no longer endure healthy teaching, but will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears and will turn themselves away from the truth and be turned unto fables. Once again, a sign of the last days. The church lacks discernment. And that's why we go through word for word, chapter by chapter, books of the Bible, to equip you for works of service. And if it doesn't matter to you, check your own heart, because truth does matter. Truth matters. It sets you free, and lies keep you in bondage. And I'm going to assume you want to be free. And if you want to be free, it comes through the Word of God. And that's what we're looking at here in Matthew chapter 23. You see, false teachers render can, can, can uh, actually give false teachings and keep people in bondage, and they can also render genuine disciples ineffective in their service to God. And how can they do that? Even a genuine believer who's not discerning and reading the Word of God can be taken by bad error, bad teaching, and what happens is it changes what God's Word says concerning who He is and gives you a faulty understanding. What they do is they elevate, these false teachers will elevate their own opinions, above God's declarations. And so as Christians, we're to be aware of how false teachers will affect us, and we need to avoid their teachings. Uh, again, in, in Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, Paul said it like this. He said to the church of Rome, I, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Smooth talk and flattery. In 2 John verse 8, John said, Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive, he says, a full reward. So again, here in Matthew 23, Jesus is speaking to the multitudes as well as his disciples. And he, he begins to speak concerning the religious leadership of the nation of Israel. And as you look at this, you're going to see that he's declaring these religious leaders to be insincere, to be unloving, as well as being prideful. In the first seven verses, I've isolated some five characteristics of false teachers. And then in the following five verses, I isolated five characteristics of a true teacher. And so we're going to be looking at that together as we go through Matthew 23. Remember with me that false teachers were not a new phenomena in the history of Israel. Throughout Scripture, from the beginning all the way to the end, God speaks concerning false teachers. You can see, for example, in the book of Jeremiah, a prophet who ministered around 627 or so before Christ, how that he spoke in the name of the Lord and said this, it's found in Jeremiah 23, 16, and this is what the Lord Almighty says, do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, and not from the mouth of the Lord. Be careful, he said, with these who are coming and giving you their own opinions, their own fleshly visions. They're not speaking for me. You have those false teachers in the old, and you have warnings in the new concerning false teachers who continue to exist even into the age of the church. In 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3, the apostle Peter said, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them. Their destruction has not been sleeping. False teachers. We've all encountered false teachers. We've had them knock on our door. We've had them hand us uh, pamphlets uh, at, in front of stores. Um, we, we've had them uh, 
encounter us through the airwaves, you know, on, on the internet. And there are a lot of false teachers, and, and they're out there right now attempting to deceive. We've encountered them many, many times. So Jesus is speaking here concerning false teachers. He's been speaking to the Pharisees, and now he gives a stinging rebuke, as well as a clear warning to them. He's speaking directly to the multitudes. He's speaking to his disciples, and this is occurring in the uh, temple courts. The people have heard him speaking. They've gathered around to hear him. He's very popular at this point. And now he begins to warn them concerning false teachers. He begins by exposing deception and hypocrisy. And he says it this way, verse 1, Matthew 23, Jesus spoke to the multitudes and his disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Sit in Moses' seat. Scribes and Pharisees. The scribes were the legal experts. They were responsible for copying the law and preserving it. They also taught and interpreted it. They were the primary spiritual leaders in Israel. The Pharisees were like a religious denomination. There were many Pharisees who were also scribes. They were authorities in Jewish scripture and tradition. They were the dominant group. And notice how he says it again. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. This is the first characteristic of a false teacher. When he says they sit in Moses' seat, that word sit is a word in the original language, in the Greek language, that speaks of seating yourselves. They have seated themselves, which is another way of speaking of self-appointed authority. They are self-appointed leaders. It's believed that every synagogue in Israel had what was called Moses' seat, which was a special chair. The most respected scribe in the community would be seated on that chair. And so to be seated on Moses' seat was to wield spiritual authority. So as a group, the scribes and Pharisees were occupying the place of authority. They taught the people concerning the law of God as revealed by Moses. But the problem was, Jesus is pointing out, they were self-appointed. They took the position for themselves. Why? Because they like power. You see, true biblical authority isn't the result of selfish ambition for position. Biblical authority isn't sought after with a prideful, self-serving attitude. Spiritual position actually comes from the Lord. In Psalm 75, 6 and 7, it says, Exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. You know, spiritual authority, a, posi a position of authority, isn't something that you chase after just because you want to be important, just because you want to have the uh, admiration of people. Spiritual authority is something that is appointed to you by God. That, again, in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, he gave some uh, to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. He gave some. It doesn't say they sought it for themselves. Now, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, it says, If any man desire the office of bishop, he desires a good thing. There's an internal motivation that I have to want to serve the Lord, but it isn't for my own purposes or my own position. It's a desire that God has placed in my heart that I respond to in order to, to follow him and to be placed in a position of leadership. You see, Jesus' authority came from his Father, and authority is given by the Lord and recognized. Authority will be recognized by elders. Elders will recognize the authority that somebody can have because they simply uh, can see that God is, is moving in somebody's life. And, and also a congregation, when they, uh, they are seated under somebody's spiritual authority, a congregation will recognize it also. They'll say, this person indeed teaches the truth as it is in truth. And thus I can listen to them because they are not self-appointed, but have been recognized in this particular way. But Jesus is saying that a false teacher sets themselves as spiritual leaders. He says that they do. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They have a place of authority. But he goes on in verse 3, say, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. So insofar as they correctly teach the law, you will follow what they have to say, but be very careful not to mimic the way that they live because they teach you one thing and do another. So insofar as they correctly teach the law, they can be listened to. But 
there's something about them that you need to also be aware of. Again, in verse 3, is that they demand from others what they themselves will not do. Jesus said, whatever they tell you to observe, observe. In other, in other words, whatever conforms to Scripture, this is what you obey. They can teach one thing, but remember with me, and I'll say this very briefly, I've said it so many times to you, but it's very important. It's not just that you say something, it's that you actually do something. It's a combination of the two. Again, the Greek thought that, that knowledge was the accumulation of information. So I would be knowledgeable if I went through certain schools and I got certain, we'll say certain degrees, if I had a lot of information. But the Jews didn't think of knowledge in that way. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. For the Jew, knowledge wasn't something you accumulated as simple information. Knowledge was taking that information, assimilating that information, owning it, and living it out. That's why James made it very clear that we are not to merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves. We are to do what it says because truth is lived out in a human life. So Jesus is saying, listen, when they are teaching you and they're correctly uh, giving the word, the word itself is true, but don't follow their behavior because they'll tell you what to do, but they don't do it themselves. Now there's a third thing you see in, for, in verse four, and that is they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders, they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. There's another thing about them that you notice, and that is that they have no compassion for those who hurt. Notice how it says, they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. They overload you like you're a camel or a donkey or any other beast of burden. Their teachings do not set you free. They only enslave you to legalism. Jesus is in a synagogue. There's a woman who has been bound with the spirit of infirmity for many years. They're watching Jesus to see what he's going to do. He sets her free. And immediately they attack Jesus Christ because they were more concerned with their legalism and their ritual than they were about a person who had at one time been in bondage but has now been set free. And that's how they are. There's no love in them. They bind heavy burdens on you. And their, their teaching only produces fatigue from your own efforts in your attempts to become acceptable to God. We call them heavy condemnation ministries because they produce bondage. I was at home and there was a knock on the door. Two young men were standing at the door and I answered, I said, hi, how can I help you? Oh, we're just going through the neighborhood. We're inviting people to, to church. I said, well, what church are you inviting them to? They gave me the name of the church. I said, oh. They said, we have a Wednesday night Bible study. Would you like to attend? And I said, you know, I already have a Bible study that I attend. <laughs> I didn't tell them I taught it. I said, I have a Bible study that I attend on Wednesday. I appreciate the invitation, though. And they said, well, what church do you attend the study at? And I said, Calvary Chapel. Oh. And they look at each other. Yeah, they look at each other. And uh, that's the church that says you need to have Jesus in your heart. Did you know? And then they, they started wanting to fight with me, you know, about that. And, and you know... They came from a church that was heavily legalistic. I recognize the name of the church, heavily legalistic. It's not that they don't have the essential um, salvation message they do, but the way they do things there, they, they place burdens on the people, and they're too hard to carry. They really are. 
and I'm familiar with their background, I'm familiar with their history, I'm familiar with their doctrines. So we had a conversation concerning that about the grace of God because see the grace of God as revealed through Jesus Christ, as given to us and declared to us and explained to us through the word of God, the grace of God is not intended, of course, to give us permission to continue in sin, but the grace of God has been given to us in order that we might be free from its bondage so that we can have freedom in Christ. And a, a false teacher will put you under rules and regulation and keep you doing the things that they tell you, though they themselves would not lift a finger to remove the burden from you. The Bible, Bible teaches us, though, that Jesus Christ came in order that we would be set free. Remember how he said, come unto me, all you who are weary and, and burdened, and I'll give you rest. How, he said, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You see, the problem is, is and this is real. I mean, this is something, I don't know how to say it clearly enough for, for you to know how, how deeply it, 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 it goes. They don't love people. They don't love people. I, 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 don't, I don't approve of a lot of behavior that is anti-scripture, anti-Christ. I don't. I don't. I teach the word of God so that we might know the truth and be free. But I don't hate the people who are in bondage. You love them enough to tell them the truth and you pray for them that they'll be set free. Do I love every single person? I, I, I better say this quickly. Uh, in Christ, I want to. Is it easy to? That's, an, that's something else. That's different. In Christ, I want to. By him, can I? Yes. Have I arrived? I, am, I, am I the most loving man you'll ever? No. No. Of course not. Of course not. Do I want to be a loving man? That's a different question. Yes. Do I seek the Lord to be a loving man? Every day. Have I changed from what I was when I first got saved to what I am now? Absolutely. Have I grown up? Yes. How did it happen? The Spirit of God and the Word of God. And seeing people as being in bondage to their sin and a need to be set free. Is it easy all the time? No. Do I get angry at people to this day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do I do about it? I take it to the Lord. God help me. God help me. This person has injured a friend of mine. This person has injured one of my children. This person has hurt one of my kids. This person, my grandkids. This per Lord, help me not to be bitter towards them. Help me not to carry anger towards them. Help me to be an agent that helps them be set free because, Lord, they're in bondage. And that's how I pray. And that's how I seek the Lord because I just want to be a, a real disciple of Christ not somebody who comes out on a Sunday and says, do this and do this. No, I want to be someone who's doing that. Because I know, I know that when, when we determine to obey God, he said, I'll show up and I'll give you some depth that you never had before. Now, false teachers don't do that. They don't have compassion. I've seen some of the false teachers where they have robbed people by claiming to have have healed them in the name of Christ and taken large offerings from them and left them in a crippled state. I've seen that. And that isn't love. That isn't faith. That is using people. And there are so many people who do that today and so many innocent and naive sheep that have been taken by these people. A fifth thing, rather, um, a fourth thing, verse 5. False teachers desire attention. It says, all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. All their works they, they, they do to be seen by men. Their religion is on the outside. It's not originating on the inside. They, they will pray and they will fast and they will give, but that's so others admire them. For them, Jesus is saying, religion's a show. They want to be admired by men. He speaks of phylacteries. This uh, phylactery was a small leather case. It's a box, a capsule, and it contained scripture. They would place it in the, before their eyes, 
and uh, they would also have it on their left arm because that's closest to their heart, and it was supposed to remind them of the law of God. They would widen the straps, making them easier to be seen, and that's what he's speaking about. He speaks concerning enlarging the border of their garment. We need to know that Jewish men had tassels on the corners of their garment. That's found in Numbers 15, verses 38 through 40. They would have borders. They had tassels on the borders. I'll give you an example. When, when Jesus um, was at the well in Samaria, if you, if you remember your, your biblical geography, you had the north, the Galilee, the center is Samaria, the south is Judah. In the center, Samaria, Jesus was in that region. That region, Samaria, early in the history of Israel, had been, had been taken by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians had brought peoples from different lands into that region. And they had mixed the people from various places with the Jewish population that had remained. And they created a sort of, a, if you will, a, a hybrid type of a, of a people called the Samaritans. The Samaritans uh, tried to worship after the Jewish God because that was part of their tradition, but they also included the various religions of the peoples that they had originally come from. And so it was a mixture of Jewish religion and, uh, and, and other religious uh, beliefs that had sort of just mixed together, and they had their own temple that they would worship in, in, the, in that region, region there called Samaria. And so the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans because they were pagans and uh, the Jews had no relationships with them. But there's Jesus at the well of Sychar in Samaria. When a woman approaches, we all know the story, I don't have to give you all the details, the woman approaches, Jesus sees her as she's going to get some water, she's drawing water from a well, and he says, give me something to drink. The woman stops and looks at him, and she says to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, is asking water from me, a woman of Samaria? Now, how did she know he was Jewish? The Jews just complexion, hair color, eyes, everything. They looked just like Samaritans. How do you know the difference? How did she know that he was a Jew? Because she says it to him. How is it that you being a Jew, did he have a t-shirt on with the star of David? I mean, was he, how did she know? How did she know? Jews wore tassels on the robes, blue thread it would seem that she's looking at him and she sees his dress, the way he's dressed. And she sees the tassels identifying him as a Jew. And so she asks, how is it that you being a Jew asks a drink or water from me, a woman of Samaria? And then John adds that addendum, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So Jesus is speaking of the tassels that the Jews would wear that were according to Mosaic law out of Numbers 15, and he is saying what they do is they make these tassels and the, the hems of the garment broad so that they're ostentatious. Once again, they're attracting uh, attention from people. They enlarge the border of the garments because they desire attention from people and not honor from God. A false teacher wants your attention, but he doesn't want God's honor. Do anything he can to keep you, anything he can to make you happy, just as long as you keep coming. And many times there's a saying in the church we used to use, they're more concerned with nickels and noses. Nickels and noses, money and people. As long as I've got a, a full haul of people, I'm satisfied because I can say how many people follow me and I can show how much money they give to me. And that's the mark of a false teacher. In verses six and seven, false teachers do not have humility. It says they love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, rabbi. Rabbi, they do not have humility. They love the places of honor. They'd even fight for the seat next to the host. They prized the chief seats in synagogues. They wanted to be in the front so that everybody could see them. 
They love public attention. They like to receive honor. He says they like to be called rabbi. The word rabbi in this context speaks of the eminent one, the great one, the doctor. They want to be known by a title. They want to be known as important. There's a, a movement, this is gonna to sound to some of you, I'm sure, judgmental, and, but it's true. There is a movement amongst many people who, who are using the title today, and this is, what, this is what Jesus is talking about. They're using the title doctor. There are quite a number of quote unquote ministries on TV that they'll say, turn on to hear the ministry of doctor so-and-so. And the fact is, is, they don't have earned doctorates. They haven't earned it. You know, they, they have what are called honorary titles. Now let me tell you something you may not know. Some of you do, some of you may not. When somebody receives an honorary title, it lacks integrity when they call themselves by the name. I, I received an honorary degree. I received an honorary degree but I don't call myself by the name. Why? I didn't earn that degree. If I earned the degree, then I have a right to use the title. I didn't earn the degree. It was given to me in honor. And so it's just something that you have, but you don't call yourself by. And, and I mentioned this a long time ago. I can actually tell you when. It was right around 92, 93. I mentioned this. I was teaching this passage a long time ago, and I mentioned by name somebody everybody knew. So I used the name. I used to use names a lot, and I did. I wanted you to know who I was speaking about. I didn't want you walking out saying, I wonder who that was. No, I tell you, it was this person. And I did that. I did it by habit because I wanted to let you know, this is what I'm saying. Check me out. See whether it's true or not. So that was just another way of being accountable to you. Well, I mentioned this guy's name. I said he calls himself by the name doctor, but he's never earned his doctorate. He has an honorary. But the reason he calls himself by the name doctor is because he believes that the title doctor has a therapeutic ring to it. I was only quoting him. He said, I call myself doctor because it has a therapeutic ring that people would prefer calling me doctor over pastor. So I said, he has taken a title given to him by God if he's a called man, pastor, and he's taken a title given by men in an honorary sense called doctor, and he has valued being called a doctor over being a pastor, and that is a dangerous thing to be because you cannot be taking honors in that way when you didn't earn them. I mean, anybody who had earned a PhD or a THD spent many years to get that doctorate. And then somebody like me who receives an honorary, I start putting it on the wall and I start calling myself Dr. David Rosales. That's just wrong to do because it's giving you the impression that I earned something that I didn't earn. And so rather than using that title, it would have been better for him to have the title that was given to him, which would have been pastor over doctor. Well, I said that and it went over the air. And then I get a call. You're going to get sued. You're going to get sued. If you use these guys' names, they are now suing Christians for exposing them. But you know what? Bottom line is, you don't take titles for yourself. You don't walk around trying to be some person of honor. I, years ago, I, somebody came and spoke to me and I was sharing with them and they mentioned an individual. I don't remember his name, but mentioned this individual. And, and I said, well, I said, I saw him in the news and what he did was really not biblically solid. And I wasn't condemning the guy. I was observing as a pastor and, and say, no, this is wrong. You don't do those kinds of things. It brings the name of Christ into shame. So he goes and tells the guy what I had said. So the guy writes me and he tells me off with the two page letter, you know, how angry he was at me. Who are you? And this and that, you know, and I read it and then he closes it doctor of theology, you know, PhD, THD. So I wrote him back and I wrote back and I said, this is where you're wrong. You're wrong about it. This, 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 and by the way, what you did brings shame in the name of Jesus Christ and you ought to repent for what you did. And I wrote David Rosales, HSG, high school graduate. <laughs> so what? 
I'm telling you, you know, we, it's just true. It's true. So you're not some great one, and you don't run around trying to be. You know, the Lord lifts up one and puts down the other. It's all about him, isn't it? And that's the bottom line. So Jesus is pointing it out. He's saying these people are doing things to be honored by men. And so I told you I had five other things to share with you. I can, you watch, I'll show you. We'll be through in just a couple minutes. So those are five marks of a false teacher. What are the spiritual leaders like? Five things, we'll close rapidly. Verse eight. But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher in Christ, the Christ, and you are all brethren. First, you do not need to be called by a great title. True shepherds do not seek elevated titles. They are servants of Jesus. It's not that the teacher shouldn't be recognized, and it's not that he shouldn't be esteemed for being faithful, because honor is commanded to be given to those who deserve such honors. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, we ask you brothers to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you, hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. 1 Timothy 5, 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. You see, the sad fact is often genuine shepherds are not regarded and the false ones are. Paul was speaking to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, and he said at verse 11, I've made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. I ought to have been commended by you, for I am not in the least inferior to the super apostles, even though I'm nothing. But he went on in verse 15 of the same chapter to say, I will very gladly spend it, be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I'm loved. I love you, but you don't love me. But you know, ministers do not do it to be loved by the congregation. Ministers do it because they love the congregation. A false teacher doesn't do that. They want something from that congregation. A second thing found in verses eight and nine, he said, one is your teacher, the Christ, and you're all brethren. You see, Jesus is the primary teacher, not some great rabbi or religious tradition. And so a, a genuine teacher will not fall into the trap of following a man's tradition. There are no such things as super Christians. There are no men who are spiritually superior and above others. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that causes us to love and respect one another in Jesus Christ. He says in verse nine, don't call anyone on earth your father. You see, the scribes were regarded as spiritual fathers and they loved having such a title. They grew to pride themselves on such relationships as a result they were demeaning people because they wanted to be above them. A third thing about a genuine teacher is that they answer to God first and they don't place man's authority over the word of God. He's saying, do not elevate any man or woman to a higher spiritual station. Do not do that. Verse 10, do not be called teachers. One is your teacher, the Christ. So do not elevate them to a higher spiritual uh, station because you're all one in the Lord. You see, <laughs> true teachers are not elevated but above the church, but are members of it, which is a fourth thing. True teachers are not elevated. You see, a genuine teacher doesn't strive for preeminence and doesn't strive for recognition. The Bible teaches us, of all things, that a true teacher is simply a servant, because finally, he says this, verse 11 and 12, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. At the end of the day, there's only one true Savior. There's only one true person that you should follow with all of your heart, and that's Jesus Christ. Every one of us, and I'll close by saying it like this, every one of us, everyone, every pastor I know, beginning with myself, every one of us has failed. I don't know how many I've hurt. I, I know I've hurt many. Did I intend to? No. Have I ever went out of my way to try and hurt somebody? To my knowledge? N not with the intent to hurt somebody, no. Have I hurt people? That's a different question. Yes, I have. Have I disappointed people? I have no doubt. I've been told it. How do I feel about that as a pastor? 
I sorrow over it. I, I, I would not with intent hurt somebody, but have I is a different question. Maybe I've hurt somebody in this room here. Perhaps I have. I'm sorry. Didn't intend to, but I do. But I do. I've had people, uh, this isn't a moment to start telling you stories, but I'll, I have had, I'll give you one. I have had people who have been angry at me and hurt with me and because I didn't hug them when I walked by them. I didn't hug them when I walked by them. And so all of a sudden I'm hearing so-and-so left the church. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because you didn't hug him when you saw him. You know, that happens. Sometimes, sometimes a genuine shepherd doesn't even see the person there. They just don't. But it's not because they don't want to care for him. It's that sometimes they, they, they didn't even know that they had a need. They didn't know. But there's only one person I know who's never turned his back on me. Only one person I know who's never ignored me. There's only one person I know whose ears are open unto my cry all the time. That's the Lord. That's why I worship him and not man. That's why I worship Jesus Christ. Listen, I will fail you, but he never will. Keep your eyes on him. What can I say? What can and that's, no, that's not an excuse. That's not an excuse to be mean. It's just honest. It's a fact. It's real. You've been hurt, so have I. None of us have ever met a perfect person outside of Christ. That's why I keep my eyes on him. That's why I do. And I give you a lot of grace because God gives you grace. And I just hope that you can give me grace too, because if you can, we can accomplish great things in Jesus Christ together. But if we judge one another and bite one another and devour one another, we will cripple one another. So we need to have grace towards one another, amen? Love one another and watch what God can do. A true shepherd wants to walk in humility, never sees themselves for what God has made them, because he's not looking at himself. He's looking at the God who made him. He doesn't want to walk in pride and be known. Listen, when our church, and I'll close with this, when our church was young, I would have people approach me when it was a year or two years old, and they would say this. It happened all the time. They would say, David, what do you want me to call you? I'd say, I'm sorry, what do you want me to call you? I'm new to this church. What do you want me to call you? Now, you need to remember, I was 31 years old, 32 years old, and sometimes there were older people who were approaching me. What do you want me to call you? And I'd say, my name is David. Please feel free to call me by my name. But aren't you the pastor? I said, yes, but you'll call me pastor when I'm your pastor. Right now, I'm David. Because I discovered that eventually those who thought it was their pastor would call me pastor. Those who thought of me as David always called me David. And I was able to know who were the sheep of this church and who were visitors, who were people who wanted me to pastor them and who didn't. I'm not gonna force myself into your life. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. And if I'm your shepherd, you know who I am. And if you're my sheep, I'll get to know who you are. And if I don't get to know who you are here, guess what? I will in heaven, and together we'll sit down and have a great time in Jesus because we worship the same Lord. That's how it works.